Right. When I was eight years old at my primary school, they hung a poster like this one. You know, it's a globe, and a lot of people are on top of that globe, and many people are falling off from all sides. Do you recognize these kind of posters? Yes, of course. The message is completely clear. It's about population growth. It's about overcrowding of our, our planet. The message is we are too many, and we have to stop multiplying. Because the earth is one cake, you know, and the more people eat from that cake, the sooner the cake will be finished. Well, now we are 50 years later, and in the meantime, the world population grew from 3.6 billion people up to 7.6 billion people. So we added 4 billion people to the world's population in half a century, and that's a lot. And of course, our fears are not gone. The idea is still that we soon will hit our planetary boundaries. There's too many people and there's too many problems because of population growth. But still, population growth will not stop. According to projections from the United Nations, the next, this century, at least 3 billion people will be added to the world population. We will hit 10 or probably 11 billion people. And of course, many people fear, where can we, where can we, how can we accommodate all these people? There are so many people in the world already. Well, when I was a schoolboy, I thought like this. When I was a student, I had the same worries in the 80s. But now, in the 90s and today, I changed my mind. I think we can perfectly accommodate the next 3 billion people. And actually, I think when there are another 3 billion people, the world will be a better place because of them. And I will tell you why. And the first reason is this man. And this man, he is a church father and his name was Tertullian. And he lived about 200. And this Tertullian, in his time, he was very concerned about population growth. Imagine at his time, world population was 30 times smaller than it is today. But still, this is what he wrote in one of his essays. He said, world population is steaming. Our numbers are burdensome to the earth, which hardly has sufficient resources to sustain our life. We hear of all, on, on all sides that nature is not longer able to supply our needs. And when I heard this, it is 18 centuries ago, I thought, ah, so probably worrying about population growth is a matter of all time. And then I heard about Plato and Aristotle, and they lived 600 years before Tertullian. And at that time, world population was 60 times smaller than world population is today. And Plato and Aristotle were concerned too, and they wanted to curb the overcrowding of our planet. So, I concluded that worrying about population growth, it doesn't matter how many people are on our planet. People always worry, there are too many. And when they worry, there's one word that is very key, and that is scarcity. It's always the same argument. There are too many people for that cake that the Earth provides to us. There are too many people. So there will be, there's not enough water, there's not enough fresh air, for breathing. There is not enough energy, there's not enough food. It means too many people there will be hunger. And when there's hunger, there will be war, because a hungry man is an angry man. That's what we know. Scarcity. There's another reason why I changed my mind. People like Tertullian, he, because he was very concerned about this overcrowding, he was advocating extreme measures to curb population growth, to push it back. And he said, we should have famines and wars and earthquakes. And it's a, nice, it's a good way to have less people. That's what he thought at that time. And in our time, at least in the 19th century, there was Thomas Walters. He was a British reverend. And this Thomas Walters, again, he was very concerned. He said, oh, we have to push back population growth by spreading famines and spreading malaria among the poor, of course, among the poor. And in our time, there is an American environmentalist, his name is Paul Ehrlich, the author of a book that's called The Population Bomb. 
And Paul Ehrlich, he suggested that we should add poison to our tap water to make women infertile. Of course, these were ideas, but these ideas, some of them were implemented. Think about the time of Malthus. At that time, it was the British Empire. The British had a lot of colonies, and in two colonies, there were really huge famines, famines, devastating famines, one in Ireland and one in India. But the British government refused to intervene, they refused to engage, because they thought these famines, this is a way to curb the population growth in Ireland and in India. In Nazi Germany, Nazis were very concerned about the lack of Lebensraum for their people, for the Germans. That was the main reason they killed millions and millions of people in the eastern part of Europe. In China, at the time of the one-child policy, millions of women were forcefully sterilized or aborted because the Chinese thought there are too many Chinese. Sure. What really triggered me is this cartoon. Probably you know this one too. It's an overcrowded earth. You see people standing next to each other on a very narrow space. And when I saw that cartoon, I thought, ah, how large would be the, 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 the surface of the earth that we would occupy if we really would put all these people together, let's say every individual on a tile of one square meter, more or less the way that we were sitting there. Mm -hmm. So imagine we take 9.6 billion people, it's 9.6 square meter, is it the surface of France, of Europe, probably of China? No, of, of course not. It's the surface of two Dutch provinces, of Brabant and Limburg. And that's all. The whole world population can fit into these two provinces. And the rest of the Netherlands and the rest of the world is completely human free. But of course, this is uh, it's completely exaggerated, I know, it's as ridiculous as the previous cartoon, but still, uh, because we need a lot of space, you want to, 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 to swim, you want to grow food, to produce things, you want to go uh, far, hiking in vast forests, you want to be surrounded by nature, of course, but still, it gives you the idea that all this is still possible, even probably when we have three billion extra people in our world. But let's go back to Tertullian and to his complaint that we are too many and that there will be scarcity so that when there are more people, that prosperity will go down. Well, the way to do that, I think, is to go back to the start of uh, the, the, the previous century, to the time of our parents and grandparents. Let's go to 1990, exactly 100 years ago. At the start of that tremendous growth of 6 billion people uh, that added up to 1.8 people at that time. And now we are 7.6. When we go back to 1990, to that time that our grandparents or grand-grandparents were young. My grandparents were 19 by that time. We can compare the situation. Get, was the, is the world getting worse since that time or is the world better since that time? I give you a few arguments. At that time, imagine one out of three children worldwide died before its fifth birthday. At that time, 80% of the world population was extremely poor. And today, it's 10% of the world population. And today, not one out of three children died before its fifth birthday, but one out of 25. At that time, life expectancy was 40 years worldwide, and today life expectancy worldwide is 72. At that time, we had horrible diseases that are gone today. One of them was smallpox. In 1919, millions of people were killed because of smallpox. In the complete 20th century, 300 million people were killed by smallpox. It's twice as many as people were killed in all the wars in the 20th century. And smallpox is one of the diseases that is completely gone by now. Or well, think about climate. Today we worry about climate change. But people at that time, like my grandparents, they worried about the climate. The 
climate was much more dangerous than the climate is today. In 1990, about 500,000 people died because of climate-related weather, like draws, floods, and heat waves, and storms. 500,000. Last year, no 500,000, but only 9,000 people died because of climate-related weather events. Of course, the climate is going to change, but the number of people that survive is, is, is increasing a lot. And the reason is, of course, that we protect ourselves against climate. We, have, we build stronger buildings, we build uh, resilient agriculture, uh, we have dikes and dams and early warning systems and better hospitals, whatever. That's the reason. Realize the number of people who died because of climate-related weather went down from 500,000 to 9,000. The world population increased with 6 billion people. The chance that you and I will be hit through a climate-related weather event decreased by 95% last century. And probably, uh, of course, I could go on for hours, you know. I could talk about the emancipation of women. I could talk about the emancipation of sexual minorities. I could talk about the decrease of torture and uh, the death penalty or slavery, for instance. And I think the best... Oh, and, and to today, on a very fast pace, and it's completely new, we start to protect endangered animals. We start to protect nature reserves. It has never happened in history, but today we are doing it. And I think the best argument that the world went better is the fact that population grew so fast, so tremendously. Some people think that population grow, that the reason was that we are having more children, but of course that's nonsense. It's not that we are breeding like, like rabbits. The fact that we are not dying anymore like uh, flies. We kept our children alive, and that's a big push behind population growth, and that's fantastic. And still, if you read the newspaper, you think of a, that the world is in a dramatic state. But of course, that's completely nonsense. If you look at the data, if you look at the back at the past 25 or 50 or 75 years, then you will find that the world is much, much better. Uh, the, the tremendous increase of population went hand in hand with a tremendous increase in prosperity. And still, let's go back to Tertullian, let's go back to Maltes and to Ely and to Plato and Aristotle. Is it not true what they say? There's just one cake, you know. And when many people are eating from that cake, the cake will be finished one day, isn't it? As soon we'll hit our planetary boundaries, we read it in the paper every day. But the fact is, what uh, Maltes and Ehrlich, etc., didn't see, they thought, of course, many more people have more mouths to eat, and more bodies that need space, and more houses that need energy and heating. But what they didn't realize, of course, that more people means more brains. They can more, solve more problems, they have more hands to act and hands to work. The only thing of that cake, that limited cake, that only contains, you know, flour and yeast and milk, what they didn't realize, the more people are there, the more ingredients are there too. The more people, the more things they add to that cake. Not only flour and milk and yeast, but they add, you know, chocolate and cream, and eggs and sugar, and nuts and almonds, and spices and fruits. The cake is getting bigger. That cake, that cake is getting more, more tasteful. There was a philosopher in the last century, his name was Henry George, and he wrote a, a lovely book, it's called Progress and Poverty. And what Henry George told us was, he said, it's not the increase of man, of food, that brought about the increase of man. No, it's the increase of man that brought about the increase of food. It's very simple. The more people are there, the more men are there, the better it will be. There will be more food, more freedom, more energy, more clean water, more fresh air to breathe. He put it like that, and that's fantastic. He says, there is a difference between an animal and a man. Both the hawk and the man, they eat chickens. 
But the more hawks, the fewer chickens, while the more men, the more chickens. Well, that's about it. So this is a story of progress, of course. But of course, it doesn't mean that you have to lean back. You know, accommodating three billion extra people is a major challenge. One of the reasons is that today, nature, biodiversity is under pressure. And still, there are 10% of the world population that is very poor. And I think that should be our first priority. But when you look back at history, you see, we can do it. We can restore biodiversity. We can help this 10% 10 of people to escape from this dire poverty. We can do that. Well, a few minutes ago, we went together to the parents of, my, of the time of my great, my grandparents and our great grandparents to 1919. Now I will finish with a jump to the time of our children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren. We will go to 2119. And imagine one day in 2119, there is a, a venue like this, and people are sitting there, and someone is standing in front of them, <laughs> and they ask. What would you think? Would it be nice to go back one day to 2019? It's the time of TED Talks, and the Lockhall, and Netflix, and Spotify. And probably you say, no, of course not. 2019, that was a horrible time. Imagine, one out of 25 children passed away before his fifth birthday. Imagine, life expectancy was just 72. <laughs> imagine people, imagine poverty, 10% of the world population was living in poverty by then. At that time they had terrible wars in the Middle East. They were worrying about climate change, didn't have a solution to that at that time. There were the diseases like cancer and Ebola and Alzheimer, they didn't have a cure for that. Oh no, 2019, we are happy to stay to, uh, to be 2119. A problem is that guy will add the following, he will say, the fact that there were so many problems in 2019, the, the, the reason was there were only 7.6 billion people by that time. It was just too less to solve all the problems. Thank you very much.